Hello out there on the internet. We are back. My name is Anthony Russo. I am here with Dr. Pastor Willie Rice, and you are listening to what we lovingly refer to as the Rice Cast here at Calvary Church. We are in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, we are on the heels of an important uh, day in the life of our country, nay, the world. Time change day. <laughs> Pastor Willie? I think we could unite all Americans <laughs> on the left and the right, Democrat and Republicans, people of all races and creeds, of all loyalties <laughs> regarding sports affiliations, in saying... Why are we still doing this? What are we doing? Why are we? I mean, I was happy to have the extra hour. Don't get me wrong. Like sure. This weekend. But sure, I know sure. I will pay for it in the future. And now it gets dark at approximately 2.30 in the Two afternoon. Th- and <laughs> what are we doing? Like, uh, why are we doing this? And, uh, you know, there's an old um, uh, Native American saying, I'm told. Somebody mm-hmm. was explaining to an Indian chief years ago. Mm-hmm. I, this may be a, you know, a... a no, oh, I think I've heard this story. You know, yeah, where they, somebody was explaining that you know the United States government is going to do time change, and I, I'm told that the Indian chief, Native American, uh, said uh, only a white man could think that by sewing a foot off of one end of a cloth <laughs> and sewing it on the bottom end of the cloth, you would have a longer cloth. You've gained anything. <laughs> and I must say that I believe the Indian chief was correct in his. His assessment of that, it just doesn't seem to make much sense. It doesn't make any sense. Can we just leave the time alone and be done with it? I don't understand it. I, I've talked about my kids on the podcast before. I have a six-year-old, a three-year-old, and a six-year-old. I'm trying to explain this. Is, what are, why? Why do we do that? I have no idea. Son. I've been told why, but it makes it still doesn't make much sense. There, are, There's only going to be much sunlight <laughs> regardless of sunlight. when you're going to bed. So let's just go to bed at the right time. I, you know, anyway. And but, if I uh, may, just for parents of young kids out there, my kid has the, is one of those with the body clock that's like six a.m., six a.m., six a.m. <laughs> so the treat I get on the on that beautiful Sunday morning is five a.m. <laughs> yes. And everyone's like, "No, we get an hour of sleep." I'm like, "No, we don't. <laughs> no, we don't. It is still and is earlier now." <laughs> That I'm awake. Yes, indeed. So uh, for parents with young kids, I feel you out there. We need to stand up with one voice and say that this has got, this has got to stop. We've got to stop doing this. It's, <laughs> right. It's I think whatever no candidate good. will eventually make that part of his, like, big platform. That's it. That's got to be good for three or four percentage points in an election. <laughs> don't you think least. that there are – I think there are a number of people who would say, I really don't care about all the other stuff. Not saying they should have that position. Right, I'm just right, saying right. there will be a number of people – we don't care about all the national debt and health care and immigration. Yeah, yeah. But if someone will just deal with the time change, they right. have my vote. It'll put you over the top. And it'll put you over the top. You just fix the time change. <laughs> and you get – and you, maybe we have some Arizona listeners because I think they're ahead of us on that. I think Arizona has said we're – I think they're the one that we're just not doing. We're it. done. We're not changing the time. You I guys, think there were enough Native Americans they, in they, Arizona. They, they, they said, yes. This makes no sense. They were able to <laughs> inform the other residents. It's the silliest thing that we do, but we did it. Uh, we all made it through, and we are at that time of the year uh, where the sun goes down at 4.30. <laughs> uh, and that's just where we are. But we're doing it, Pastor. We're doing it. We're here today. We're back with another podcast. Uh, and you're back. You were just uh, – you spoke at the Florida Baptist Convention over the last couple of days. Is that correct? Uh, yes, had the privilege of speaking there Sunday night, and uh, our Florida Baptist Convention was a meeting in Lakeland, and uh, it was a terrific meeting, I must say. We just mm-hmm. have such a great network. I know nationally we've talked about some of the problems nationally, and uh, but, you know, uh, I, I think sometimes you just need to look at locally sometimes mm-hmm. and, and the friendships and networks, because we have a wonderful network in the state of Florida. Uh, Tommy Green, my friend, is our executive director, and... Uh, uh, I've just, uh, you know, uh, just so grateful. Such great preaching, great fellowship, great mm-hmm. spirit in the meeting in Lakeland, and want to thank all those who were involved in in the meeting. Now, I, I want to ask something, and it may be it may be a little too behind the curtain, but I th- I, I need to hear your thoughts on this. A uh, little behind the scenes, you were you were originally not scheduled to speak at this event. Yes, right? you know I've spoken a number of times, and and uh, you know, uh, but wasn't planning to speak this year. And Dr. Robert Smith, who is a well known African American preacher, and I mean a preacher, yeah, yeah. what a brilliant orator, brilliant intellectual giant. I mean, yeah. if you've ever heard the man preach, you just pins could drop. I mm. mean, he he is brilliant. 
and not just brilliant, and then he usually ends by bursting out in song. Mm. You know, and and it's just so people love to hear Robert Smith preach. Yeah, yeah. Well, he got had a stroke. He is recovering, I understand, and doing well. Right. <laughs> so they called me like two weeks before and said, "Would right. you fill in?" Like no one can fill in for Robert Smith. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, we we were able to to preach, and the Lord put a word on our heart uh, based on some things we had been preaching in other places, and and uh, and and uh, so put kind of some thoughts together for that, and it went well, and the Lord blessed. And that's kind of what I wanted to ask about there. You get you 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 preach here, uh, and we love that we get to hear all the time. And then you've you've had the privilege we've talked here of, of preaching other places. You did the the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm wondering what it's like to get the call of hey, the other guy can't <laughs> do it. You know you're you know. And this again, we're, we we did the whole contest, but you just know you weren't the first that's choice. That's right. That's right. But you're getting the call now. <laughs> uh, the other guy didn't work out. How did, is that call any different than the uh, other it's call? Fine. I, you know, uh, Cliff Lee is the president. Such a friend, and I've had the privilege to listen to him speaking a number of times at yeah. the Florida Baptist Convention. And Cliff was Cliff was my dear friend. He said, he said honestly, I would have loved to have you pre. You know, you've done it. I think I'd. I may have done it last year. I don't. I don't remember. Uh, and he just said, "You know, we're just." And I absolutely one thousand percent understand. You know, nobody preaches every year. And um, but uh, Cliff was so kind. He's the pastor at uh, First Baptist Leesburg, mm. and uh, he was so kind. So no, I it, uh, listen. It was. Uh, I've been there when we did the pastors' conference. One of our speakers literally, I found out the night before, couldn't arrive. Oh wow! You know, he couldn't arrive, and you know, somebody's got to get the call. So you call somebody that you can count on and right, uh, right. Uh, or want to hear. So I was very honored to get the call, very privileged and honored to be able to speak. And speaking of uh, last minute calls, I know there was some, uh, there are there are people in the Calvary family that would want to know, but you are feeling better. You're back. You're back Thank to you. Full yeah. Health. Yeah. We, we had a couple, I've been battling just kind of a chronic a sinus infection that has come with a lot of uh, fatigue and um, we've tested for COVID. You know, I, I really started dealing with this in September. Nobody wants to hear all my health issues, but uh, September and got tested right away then and was negative. Got mm-hmm. and I got tested again about a week ago. And was negative also, um, but uh, whatever it is, we won't try to hypothesize or yeah, diagnose yeah, yeah. here. But whatever it was I, that weekend, I have never um, called in on a Sunday morning. Now about a year, two years ago, I had a deal where I I, I let my staff know on Saturday I couldn't go, and mm. I that that was like two and a half years ago. I had the flu. Literally, you know, diagnosed when yeah. the doctor, you got type A flu. Uh, and so I called in on that year on Tuesday, uh, Saturday and said, hey, guys, tomorrow you got to go. And it's the first time I've ever missed. And I said it a lot two years ago. That was the first time I yeah. had ever missed a Sunday because I was sick. Right. And I was, you know, maybe a little proud about that. And the Lord may have looked down and said, yeah, well, it won't be the last time. Watch this. And uh, so this was the first time that I ever woke up on a Sunday morning and just felt like I couldn't go. I kept mm. thinking Saturday, I'm going to get better. I'm getting better. Yeah, yeah. But I wasn't. I was lying and uh, to myself. And Sunday I felt worse, and I just knew I couldn't. And uh, so our guys are professionals. They were ready to go. Mm-hmm. And fortunately, we all meet uh, during the week and talk about the message upcoming. And yeah. uh, most weeks we were able to do that. And they had uh, extensive notes and all that. So um, uh, you know, fortunately they had some things, but it also, uh, credit to Ron and Danny that day who mm-hmm. literally got the call at five something that morning. Um, and uh, I mean, what a way to wake up. Yeah. Like, uh, guess what? I need you to do it. Surprise. And, and, but the people who heard them said you wouldn't have even noticed because they, they did just great. stepped up and did great. They did great. And you're feeling better now. I'm feeling better. Thanks. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. A lot of people were praying for you. We had a lot of people reach out online and things. Uh, wanted you to know that. Okay, uh, let's talk about some other things we got to go through here. And uh, well, I did want to say this, and I, I hesitate to bring this up because a couple of years ago you said this is the first Sunday I've ever missed uh, on a Sunday yep. morning, and then you just missed a couple weeks ago. Yep, yep. And it dawned on me. So that, now we got a streak going here. Well, it dawned on me that both of those have been during my tenure I, at Calvary, true, yeah. <laughs> and I don't like I don't like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I but it's just a fact. Um, another thing we got to talk about. And I don't like this. Is a this is a it's it's maybe a, a bruise, maybe a soft spot. I don't want to push in too much here, but I thought the University of Florida football season could not get much worse. It's gotten worse. It and I heard worse. recently a player was injured while dancing. Well, it's, it's is this true? <laughs> this is what I understand. <laughs> Entered wild dancing, and then they had the flu last week, and they got beat by a, badly by a very bad team. 
it really has gone <laughs> off the rails. And maybe that is the story that needs to be told. Injured while dancing. I I, um, I saw it, this headline come across. I said, I got to ask him about this other podcast. It's gotten so bad. We could do a whole podcast on it and uh, what my <laughs> recommendations are. But they're playing my alma mater this week, Sanford. And I've been a lifelong Gator fan even when I went to Sanford. Yeah. Sanford didn't have a football team then. And I cheered for Florida then. I've always grown up a Gator, but, you know, so my, my alma mater is Sanford. Yeah. That's where I graduated. But, you know, my football team has always been Florida. Yeah. And uh, Sanford st- restarted football back after I left. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure I would have played, you know. Right. I'm just kidding. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's, played, that is a joke. <laughs> tuba. <laughs> yes, I played meaning uh, in the Martian something. Band. Yeah, something. Um, but in any case, um, uh, I think I'm cheering for Sanford Saturday. I think I'm cheering <laughs> for my alma mater. This is I'm, I, I think we may win. Uh, and just my hope is for the listeners. Notice where the we was. Mo, the we no, is usually on Florida. The we is now in Sanford. We and is and Sanford. I think as a Christian institution <laughs> we that it is <laughs> our duty to put Florida out of its misery this week. You know, when you see someone suffering, sometimes you just. Not a human, but an animal suffering. You have to alleviate the suffering. And humans, as well as animals, alleviate the suffering. Sure. And I hope that Sanford will alleviate the suffering by by necessitating an entire house cleaning in Gainesville. So that's my... I don't know anything about this story. I'm speaking into it. But it's been a bleak season, as we've already painted the picture. And a UF player has some reason to dance. This, this bright... Light of joy breaking through a darkness <laughs> that is the 2021 season for this team. And the player hurts themselves while <laughs> dancing. Yes. It's been a long, it's been a long it college. It doesn't get much worse than that. But go Sanford. Go Bulldogs. Bulldogs go right? Bulldogs. Yeah. Go Sanford. We're playing for Sanford this week. Okay. Well, that's great. Thank you for talking about that. Um, we're in missions month here at Calvary. Hey, well, I, can I jump in here? You can jump. Uh, you have a book coming out. And I, I know that you like you're very humble and don't want to mention that, but uh, I, I've got an advanced copy of a book that Anthony Russo has written uh, called uh, "Curiosities and Uncommon Sense from the Bible," and it just uses your kind of quirky sense of humor. Mm. Is quirky an okay That's word? A word? That's not a word. bad word. It's no, like I think it's good. Unique sense of humor that I just love, and is why people love Anthony around here. And uh, he would never mention this, but I said I've got to mention it. You have a book called Curiosities and Uncommon Sense from the Bible, and it just takes Bible stories and Bible events, some Mm -hmm. of which are uncommon, like stories you don't hear about, or some were stories people have heard about, but they didn't know all the details, Mm -hmm. and uh, and just uh, draw some actual great spiritual lessons from those. So Mm -hmm. I think it's funny. And um, I haven't read it all, but I've, I've, I've op- I got a copy just a few days ago and thumbed through it. And it's funny and, um, and yet has some great spiritual applications. So congratulations oh, thank you. on behalf of all the Calvary family. And go online and buy Curiosities and Uncommon Sense from the Bible. That would be wonderful. Thank you, Pastor. Yes. We're really proud of you, man. That's great. That means a lot. Yeah, it's a devotional, uh, so it's something you kind of go through. Uh, you know, don't read it all in one day. It's way too much uh, to <laughs> of me writing. Uh, so do it a little bit at a time, and um, uh, I hope people like it. Thank you very much. Yeah, very I, th- I hope it does really up. well, and uh, we're really proud of, uh, of Anthony for doing it, and hope lots of people can Calvary get it. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, is it? Yeah, you can look it up. Curiosities and Uncommon Sense from the Bible. I'm very excited. It comes out next Tuesday. Next, next Tuesday, Tuesday. It's official release. They get it online, Amazon. Yeah, yeah anywhere you buy books. Anywhere you, can, you buy you books. You can look for this thing. That's right. And it'll be out there. <laughs> well, thanks, Pastor. Um, that means a lot. Uh, here at Calvary, uh, I'll take us now into something we got going on here. Uh, we are in Missions Month here. November is Missions Month for us. Uh, so we've been talking about that series we've been going through is called The Harvest. Uh, per usual, we'll put the last sermon link in the uh, podcast description if you weren't uh, able to do that. And it's really been fun. Like it's because uh, we talked about this some, but the last year and a half, uh, it just feels like of all the ministries, a, a lot of ministries, uh, a lot of the things are endeavors here at Calvary. We're able to sort of pivot, do something a little differently, right? Student ministry could continue on, just had to look a little different. Mm-hmm. Whereas, boy, some of our like international uh, partnerships really took a big hit. Uh, we weren't able to be there mm-hmm. in person. Mm-hmm. We And you can you can try and help on Zoom, and we certainly did that. We leaned in where we could lean in, but 
uh, I don't know about for you, Pastor. I'd love to hear your thoughts. But for me, these last couple of weeks have just been fun to see some of these things kick back into gear. Uh, and be talking about them again. And and but let me say one of the things about our international strategy is that it's not just about sending Calvary people overseas. Um, we we think that international mission starts with national partnerships. Hmm. That is finding people. You know, we think the best people to reach uh, South Asians uh, in the countries who work there are are the people who live in those countries. Yeah, right. Brazilians reaching Brazilians and so forth. Uh, what we get to do is is pour you know gas on a fire. We mm-hmm. get to come along and maybe provide training, provide resources, um, and we're also trying to disciple our people when we send them overseas. So there are a lot of things going on. It isn't this idea of hey, a bunch of Americans show up and we have all the answers. Um, we we don't. We we just can right. can bring what we can bring. And uh, but God is doing great things. In other, in fact, I think we have a lot to learn from churches in uh, other parts of the world that mm-hmm. may not have our resources and may not have come from as uh, a culture that's been as friendly to Christianity as ours has been, and yet you see sometimes a pure church, a more effective church in some of those uh, countries. But um, but it's partnership, and they long for partnerships. Yeah. Believe me, they want us and being there in partnerships, not just for money, but for support and prayer and instruction, and we need those partnerships. So the good thing about it is even when COVID meant we couldn't send people overseas, the work of the gospel kept going mm-hmm. in Southeast Asia mm-hmm. and in Brazil and in all, Mozambique and, and in all these places. We just couldn't be physically a part of it. Right. But the giving that people did through X-150, we could continue to send that mm-hmm. as we did. And uh, supporting our church planters, they could get... Now, again, they were facing their own unique obstacles. Some of those countries were more locked down. And yeah. so they were facing obstacles. But the gospel still traveled, and Mm -hmm. the work was still being done just like it was in America. We just had to do it, as you said, a little bit differently. But we certainly missed the personal, physical interactions and being able to go and be on the ground, Mm. and it is exciting to see that gearing up. I think I read through as many as eight different trips that are already scheduled next year, and I don't even think that's all of the trips. Those are just some of our X-150 partnerships, and... uh, there will be more. So it's great to see that element of our missions kicking back into high gear uh, here in 2022. Yeah. Uh, the week before that, we got to talk about um, a new uh, Calvary campus that we're looking at. It's, just, it's been a fun month already talking about some different things. But it, I thought it might be a nice segue, and even a lot of what you just covered there, into a little uh, a little moment in the culture that also happened sort of recently. I thought maybe we could talk about that a little bit. So. Um, uh, Elon Musk, I believe, was the one that had the interaction. He was he was kind of kind of called out, I suppose, by this. It was a Twitter exchange that happened, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this particular exchange, but you, you may have heard of it, where um, I, I think it was like a world hunger organization or something. There was a headline that was shared uh, that was that was essentially if Elon Musk would share uh, would would uh, sell off a percentage and a pretty small percentage. Uh, of his Tesla stock or his his, his overall uh, wealth, uh, that he could end world hunger. Um, and uh, his response to that was, if you explain to me how X amount of dollars will end world hunger. I will sell the the. I will sell it right now. I will sell it all off. Yep. Uh, and it, but you have to share it publicly so that everyone can see. Uh, and it was you know of course I think he's being a little tongue in cheek. And there's been other people that have said you know that's not really the point. The art it was kind of a clickbait uh, headline. It's not really mm-hmm. article about. Mm-hmm. But it brought to the light uh, something that's definitely been brewing. I think especially in American culture about wealthy people. Mm-hmm. Um, I, if I'm and I, this one I should have written down as well. But I, I think. Uh, Jeff Bezos is scheduled to be the first trillionaire here pretty soon. So the just some 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 extreme wealth that has caused some conversations about uh, about the top one percent. You may have also heard of that mm-hmm. th- those groupings. And uh, I think it's an interesting thing to to think about yeah. during Missions Month. It's interesting to think about obviously us as a church and uh, talking about a biblical worldview that we've talked about because there are passages of scripture. Uh, that you one could certainly see and one could certainly uh, glean and uh, and some have um, to almost make it seem as though and um, wealth is a bad thing mm-hmm. and the the thing I'd point to or I think a lot of people would point to is the interaction with the rich young ruler uh, after which it, Jesus says 
Uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a wealthy person to be saved. That's not an exact translation, but that's roughly mm-hmm. the sentiment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I thought this was an interesting topic point, Pastor, and I think it boils down to uh, – I, I try to boil some of these conversations down to a question mm-hmm. uh, based – when we look through Scripture, is it okay for Christians to be rich? And I ask that knowing there's a lot of nuance to a lot of the, yep. that question, but uh, – what what are your thoughts? Yes, is the quick answer. Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> next question. Um, no, I think the quick answer is yes. Uh, there, uh, but it's a great question to press into. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I've been I was watching an Amazon series recently. Uh, Cheryl and I got into this um, series someone recommended about the men who built America or okay. something like that, and it was very fascinating. I learned a great deal about uh, the great. Uh, business leaders in America in the last part of the 1800s, early part of the 1900s, when America really became a superpower. Mm. And uh, the story of Vanderbilt, who owned the railroads, Mm. and Carnegie, who uh, owned the steel, and... um, uh, and, and gosh, um, Rockefeller, about Rockefeller that time? owned uh, the oil. Mm-hmm. He was the guy that and they all cornered something. Rockefeller cornered the oil. Carnegie cor- cornered the steel mm-hmm. uh, at the very time it was taking off. Vanderbilt had, had prior to them really cornered the railroads. And um, and then um, and then uh, you had um, a J.P. Morgan oh, okay. who uh, kind of uh, cornered uh, electricity. Mm-hmm. I got in front of the electricity and uh, work with Edison to start General Electric and Hmm. how they all monopolized all those areas and became the richest men in the world uh, at at various points. Hmm. Um, Vanderbilt and then, you know, Carnegie and and so forth. And just fascinating, these wealthy, powerful men uh, who who in many ways did build America. I mean, Hmm. um, steel, oil, transportation, electricity, they changed the world yeah, yeah. and really thrust America into the leadership in the globe. Uh, and our capitalistic system allowed for them, these these very bright, very driven men, uh, to uh, corner the market, monopolize these industries, and become fabulously wealthy. Mm-hmm. Now, several of them then gave away a great deal of their fortunes. Mm-hmm. Uh, toward the end of their life, Carnegie and Rockefeller really began to compete with each other and how much they could give away. Uh, but before that, they were extremely ruthless in how they made money. So anyway, made me think, hey, and today, you know, we have Jeff Bezos. We have we have Elon Musk. Uh, we have, you know, the guys who, uh, you know, uh, Bill Gates and the, the, the Facebook guy, Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. We have these are the magnets of today mm-hmm. with the informational systems and transportation systems and uh, – um, the, the Twitter guy, the guy that Jack Dorsey looks like yep. a like crazy guy, which I think he is. Uh, so you have these guys who are just wealthy beyond what yeah. most of us. Now, depending on how well your book does, you may be right up there right. with them. But, but you know, mo- most of us, just it's a, it's a level of wealth we can't even, most of us, conceive of. Right. Oh, yeah. When you're talking about billions For sure. of dollars. Uh, it, it, so I do think it's problematic. I don't think there's any question that when you read through the Bible that you see that um, wealth is not, money is not inherently wrong at all. There are some very wealthy people in the Bible, even in the New Testament. There are mm-hmm. some people who were obviously, I mean, I think you you, you look at people like Lydia, Lydia you know, yeah. and, and others who um, were very wealthy. Um and certainly in the Old Testament, you know, Abraham and the patriarchs accumulated great wealth, mm-hmm. David, Solomon, and others, great wealth. Um, wealth is not uh, wrong. There's not, what, what the Bible condemns is the love of money, mm. and there's a great difference. By the way, one of the things I learned about these in this series was these guys weren't so much driven by money as they were driven by competition. Mm. And, and it was interesting. They said they weren't, it wasn't, they got to a point where they had so much money, it didn't matter. Money, it was like numbers on a page. Yeah, what yeah. mattered to them was being the best. They were competitors. Mm. So they wanted. They always wanted to have more than the other guy, but it was competition to them. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, which was interesting to me. I always wanted, well, yeah, but the money was nice, wasn't it? You know, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and at some point it is there, these guys who succeed at that level, I don't think they were just driven to make money. I think they were, they were driven by competition mm. and excellence. So um, – but it's not money that's the root of it. It's the love of money that can corrupt someone. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, it's clear that when you have money, it's a huge responsibility. Mm. It, here's one of the things. It's easy to talk about the guy over there I read about in the news. What we need to realize is if you were taking 100 people around the globe, mm. 
Hmm. That most of us would probably be in the top one percent. Yeah. So if you just take a hundred human beings around the globe, right, right, um, as Americans, um, we're going to be in the top. I don't know if it's top one percent or what, but it's going to be a top percent. Yeah. And many of us would be literally in the top one percent out of a hundred people around the world. So. You know, that should cause us all to think. You may think of yourself as a working person, middle class, blue collar, whatever. But the truth is, you know, a lot of families, you know, you have two cars, you have a house, you go on vacations, you you know, you have, uh, you know, um, discretionary income. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're wealthy by most people's standards. So we can't just talk about the guy over there. We need to talk about the guy in the mirror, right? What are we doing with our wealth? And uh, how do we handle it? I think it's an important question. But the short answer is, I don't think it's wrong to have money. Mm -hmm. But the Bible does warn us about the dangers of money. Mm -hmm. And then the Bible gives us in specific directions about what to do with our money. Mm -hmm. And one of those, just to jump ahead, is very clear. It's 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, where Paul says, I instruct those who are rich in this present age. So he's writing a letter to Christians. Right. And in the letter he says, now, to those of you who are rich, so there's evidently several, you know, to those of you who happen to be rich, you've succeeded. Here's what you need to know. Mm. And he doesn't tell them they need to be guilty. He doesn't tell them they need to give it all away. Mm -hmm. Um, You need to be poor. Um, What he says is, uh, specifically, don't be arrogant. Mm. don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of wealth. In other words, first of all, don't be puffed up with pride and think you're more important than somebody else because of what you have. Right, right. Very dangerous. Many wealthy people do. Mm -hmm. We judge people according to wealth. He says, don't do that. Don't become arrogant. You know, and I think that comes from knowing everything comes from God. Everything belongs to God. I brought nothing into this world. I'm taking nothing with me. So, and by the way, some of us have had gifts and opportunities that other people who are just as smart and work just as hard may not have had. Yeah. You know, don't you may have been born on third base. Don't think you hit a triple. Mm. Okay? Now, don't be felt guilty either. Right. Just to understand you you are blessed by others. Yeah. And all of us to some degree have have benefited by others. Sure. Many of us. I suppose there are some of us who started with literally nothing and did every, you know. I know, you know, my father paid for me to go to college. Mm-hmm. A lot of people didn't have that. Mm-hmm. My father worked very hard, got up every morning and went to work and yep. never got drunk and never spent money on gambling, never gambled our money away, took care of our family and gave us, a, a, you know, a very comfortable existence. I mm-hmm. was able to go to college. I graduated without a, owing a dime. A lot of people can't say that. Yeah. Only reason I can say that because my mom and dad worked really hard. Right, right, right. So I, I'm, you know, were we wealthy? I, most people would not say we were wealthy, right. but they worked really hard, and we were certainly very comfortable. Mm-hmm. So some people were are very wealthy. Maybe your father is a multimillionaire mm-hmm. or mother. Look, first thing is don't be prideful. Yeah. Don't be prideful. Second thing is don't put your hope on wealth. Like don't build your life on it because mm-hmm. it can go. And uh, and some of the people who are most full of anxiety and fear and paranoia are wealthy people because yeah. they're afraid of losing it. Right. Listen, you're, it's not a matter of if you're going to lose it. It's a matter of when you're going to lose it. Because mm-hmm. I promise you, I don't care how much you die with, when you die, you ain't taking it with you. Mm. So don't build your life on wealth. And then he says, um, instruct those, instruct these people to do what is good, to be rich in good works and be generous and willing to share. Mm. So he says, you teach these wealthy people, Paul's writing this to Timothy, the pastor, you teach these wealthy people um, to be rich in good works. Don't just be rich in your bank account. Be rich in doing good works and be generous. You have a responsibility to be generous. To whom much is given, much is required. Mm. So be, everyone ought to give. Everyone, I think you ought to give the first 10% of your income away. I think it's a biblical standard. It's a standard I've practiced all my life. So, yes. But you know what? If you've been given a lot, you can be a lot more generous than that. Mm. So be generous and be be willing to share. Mm. So to those who – so the answer to your question is, no, I do not think it's a sin to have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's a heavy responsibility. And a lot, and listen, a lot of people, you long for that. You really don't want it. It's more of a responsibility than you know. Mm. To those who have been blessed, and that's a lot of us listening to this, when we look at it in a global perspective, yeah. we need to not be arrogant, 
Don't put your build your life on it and be generous. Mm-hmm. That's what the Bible says. What do you think it is about the love of money specifically uh, to be called out? Because because I've always thought about that passage, and that's yeah. one of the fun things I get to do uh, as the host of this podcast. Kind of is to get to ask you questions I wonder about. Because because you could almost to me, right. you can correct me if I'm wrong here, because you always do. Uh, if I'm the lo- you would say there's a lot of things that aren't kind of moral, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. the love of those things can get out of control. So. Uh, yeah, any thoughts on why specifically the love of money was called well, out? I think because it gets to the heart of pride. I think when you look at the love of money, you, you're getting at the very core of what sin is, the desire to make a great name for myself, the mm-hmm. desire to, uh, it's, it's about pride. I want more. So I think uh, what Paul was doing there is looking at the, the love of money and saying that's right there at the root of it. When you become greedy, for more, and you think your life is defined by how much you have, that's that's the root of all evil. I mean, mm. it, even whether it's sexual sin or, um, I don't know, violent sin or some other kind of sin, at the root of it is this greed and pride. Mm. Think about sexual sin is, I want something that I don't rightly have, mm. and I believe I deserve it, mm. right? Like, mm-hmm. I, want, I want that. I want that experience, that yeah, pleasure, yeah. and... I, so I, I will have it no matter who it hurts. Mm-hmm. And so when you dig around and get at the core of that, you know, you know stuff, mm-hmm. what's there? It's that sense of I want something. It's yeah. greed. I want something. And it's also somebody said greed uh, grows in the soil of ingratitude. Mm-hmm. So there's this in, I'm not grateful for what I do have. So I think that's why he said it. I think because right there at the, at the core of this desire to have more is the root of sin itself. Yeah, because that's another question I always I always come to in this subject, which I think is kind of endlessly fascinating. Because in the rich young ruler interaction, uh, you know, you you it's a scene a lot of us are probably familiar with. Uh, young rich young ruler uh, approaches Jesus and kind of says like I I kept all the ten commandments I did. Yeah. Or, uh, and then I think Jesus's first response is like. Love, love the Lord. Or no, he says, keep the Ten Commandments. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should have this pulled yeah, up. He walks through the Ten Commandments, uh, uh, and, and except thou shalt not covet. <laughs> he walks through the Ten Commandments mm. and then leaves that one out about how you treat others. And the guy says, oh, I've done all that. I've done yeah, that. Yeah. But Jesus knew, again, Jesus, now sometimes it's a problem because we, we, we take one conversation Jesus had and we try to say, well, that's the conversation everybody needs yeah, to have. Yeah, right, right. But what Jesus understood about that man is that that was his problem. He was in love with the things of this world and he was very moral. But when Jesus spoke to him about, and Jesus didn't say this to anybody else, mm. go and sell everything you have and come follow me. The Bible says he was very sad because he had a lot. Mm. Jesus understood where his problem really was. Jesus could see through it. It was a moralism, but deep down it was a, a love of this world. And, he, and, and when Jesus challenged him to forsake the world, he couldn't do it. Mm. So it is a dangerous thing. You know, to fall in love with wealth. It is a day, and it is why Jesus said it is harder for a rich person to be saved because the tendency is that if you're wealthy, you fall in love with the things of this world. Mm. You feel very comfortable. You are not willing to leave the things of this world to follow the kingdom of God. Mm. Why would you? You have everything you want now. Yeah. But you don't see that you need something much, much greater. Whereas sometimes people who are suffering have a greater gift because they, they see more clearly that. My answers don't lie in this world. I have to find hope in another. Maybe they're suffering. Maybe they're suffering with uh, poverty. And uh, I, and many Christians across the world struggle with very little. Mm. It's not hard for them to long for a different world and a better world and a a spiritual kingdom. Right, 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 right. You know, so I think the more, so does that mean we can't have nice things? Does that mean we can't? uh, Exactly. No, I don't think that at all. I think when I look at 1 Timothy 6, I think it means don't become arrogant. Be rich in good works. Mm -hmm. Uh, Don't build your life on wealth and be very generous. Use the opportunity that God... I was talking with a very successful young businessman recently who's on the cusp of a big deal. I mean, a big deal. And I reminded him, I said, and and he's wanting to honor God with all of it. I said, listen, if God blesses you in this way, this is just another opportunity to bless him and bless others by being more generous Mm. and being being able to give more away. And there's a whole group of Christian leaders out there who actually encourage one another to give their money away. Um, You know, there's a whole group of reverse tithers 
who have succeeded oh, uh, to yeah, a yeah. level that they actually reverse tithe now. They say, I live on 10% of what I make and give away 90%. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, uh, you know, ministries and charities and nonprofits and churches are blessed because of people who are able to give extraordinary in an extraordinary way. Right, right. You know, it's hard to have the gift of giving if you don't have the gift of making money because you don't have anything to give. The people who have the gift of giving usually are also very often, maybe not always, but very often they're also very successful. Mm-hmm. They they know how to make money. and uh, But then they turn around and say, but now the greatest joy I have is giving. You know, I love to make money because I love to do things. I love to succeed. I love to build things. I love to, you know, take a little and turn it in a lot. And they, they're, they're, they mo- they're motivated by that, that idea of competition, that idea of success. But then they tell you, but the money doesn't make me happy. It's like I've got what I need. I don't need just a newer car. I got mm-hmm. a nice car. I don't need another boat. I, you know. And at some point they turn around and go, the real joy is now giving it away. And what I would say to those who are blessed, if I had a conversation with Elon Musk, no, I don't think Elon Musk can solve world hunger. And, and he was very smart to turn the conversation the way he did. Because the, the problem is not just money. I disagree with people who think, well, if we just had more money, we'd solve the problem. Mm-hmm. I can tell you countries like Haiti, for instance, where billions of dollars have literally been invested. And it's like throwing money into an empty hole. Because... The reason you see inequities uh, around the world is not usually a lack of resources. A lack of resources is part of it, but it's usually systems in place that keep people from being able to profit and keep people from being able. uh, One of the great things about America is you had these huge people that made billions of dollars, but they built products that allowed, and and they had to be modified, by the way. They They did get out of control. And so there was the government did kind of come in yeah. and break up monopolies and so yeah. forth. But what happened when I merged in the early 1900s was a middle class mm. that everybody could. Ford was one of these, the automotive industry. But he what what made him? He didn't invent the car, but he invented a car that a common man could afford. Mm. And his mindset was, I want to build a car that the people who work in my factories can go out and buy. Yeah. So he made it as, as inexpensively as he could, so that. And so you built up a class of people who could enjoy the fruits of their labor. I kind of got off there. Uh, it's an important topic. But mm-hmm. just I, – I, that's why I don't believe systems like socialism and communism work. You don't make poor people richer by making rich people poorer. Mm. So I don't think Elon Musk can simply by stroking a check solve world hunger. The right, problems right, right. are more systemic and complex than that. Yeah. But I would say to Elon Musk, I would say to Bill Gates – I would say to Mark Zuckerberg, none of whom, so far as I know, happen to be Christians. So I would, first of all, want to talk to them about Jesus and (laughs) hope they would follow Christ because they will stand before God just like anyone else will Mm -hmm. and give an account for their sins, and they need Christ to save them. So they should not build their life on wealth. Mm. But if they were Christians, I would say, you know what? God has blessed you, and I have no problem with it. Think you you invented you cr- c- kind of came up with new things and I'm glad you can enjoy the fruits of your labor, but you're gonna die, just like I'm gonna die. Mm. You're gonna stand before God, just like I'm gonna stand before God. And your money in some bank account for your children and great grandchildren, and it, it honestly is probably gonna cause them more problems than good. Mm. Just look at what's happened in life. I mean, you should leave your children some inheritance. But if you just think I'm going to leave billions and billions of dollars, it's a, you're just going to mess them up. Mm. Um, they probably don't want me saying that, but that's what I would say. You're just going to mess up your grandkids. <laughs> leave them an inheritance, but don't just think you got to leave them billions and billions of dollars. Um, y- y- do something good with that. Yeah. Do Give and make a difference in people's lives uh, that will outlast you. And there are a great many wealthy people who have mm-hmm. figured that out. Mm-hmm. And and we should say to them thank you because sure. they don't have to do that. Right. So I hope Elon Musk does figure it out. Uh, yeah, the yeah. problem with these wealthy guys today is they don't have a Christian worldview and they give to stupid things. <laughs> I would say that to Bill Gates. You give to stupid things and and uh, it, that's not doing any good. So if you really want to make a difference in world hunger, for instance, I've got a whole bunch of Christian missionaries and a whole bunch of Christian ministries that I'd be happy to connect you with Mm -hmm. that would do far more good than giving it to the United Nations or some other godless (laughs) organization. That's my humble and accurate opinion. I was thinking earlier (laughs) when you were bringing up the from the Amazon show, um, it just hit me that, you know, Vanderbilt uh, is a is a uh, very famous hospital in Nashville, 
Well, in a university, university and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, hospital, I mean, yeah, yeah. And was on the front end of like developing the COVID vaccine. So it's interesting, even how some of these. I'm sure it's not named for Vanderbilt because they just liked him. I'm sure that no, was he a, gave millions of he dollars, gave yeah. a ton of money, and so you're seeing the ramifications. Carnegie of that. built libraries all across. He was also uh, Rockefeller was a Baptist, by the way. Uh, I didn't know that he was a teetotaling, oh, okay. hard nosed Baptist, and uh, and he he did give money to some churches, uh, and there's some churches, you know. Again, that's a hundred years ago, and they some of them had drifted. But he did, you know, they they he gave a lot of money in the national park system. He did a lot of things that they did do, and oh, good for them, good for them. Yeah. And uh, I, listen, I could tell you stories. I don't know Rock. I don't know Zuckerberg yeah, and Elon yeah. Musk. I wish I did. I'd be happy to share needs <laughs> with them. But with them. but I have been blessed, and Calvary's been blessed to have some people who've been yeah. very successful. And I could walk you around here and show you that there are people who have been very generous. They didn't have to be. They were because mm-hmm. they wanted to be. They wanted to invest in things that were bigger than them. And I thank God for them every time. And um, and we need, you know, may God multiply their number. Mm-hmm. And let us all learn from their example. Don't be the person saying, well, that person ought to do more. How about what you do, what you can do? You know, we can all be more generous. Right, we right, can all right. give and uh, and and um, and be grateful for what God has given you. You're not going to give an account for what you did with Elon Musk's money. Mm. You you are going to give an account for what you did with yours. Yeah. So be faithful with yours. And God will take care of the other I'm guys. I'm so glad you went there. That was kind of where I was. Uh, I was wanting to land. Is is it just because I look around at you know uh, my generation and things that are trending, and, it, and it's become kind of vogue to be really outspoken about wealthy people and what yep. they should or shouldn't be doing with their money. And I just thought there's so much of like uh, yeah. probably another co- another uh, podcast about cancel culture and how in some ways it, it is so hearkening back to like very legalistic Christianity that I remember. It's, uh, it but, is. But this is one of those things is it, I just think you got to be careful with that. Yeah. What you are you doing know. with your money? Somebody yeah. wants to talk to me about Elon Musk. I go, what are you doing with your money? Yeah. If you're not, first of all, you're not tithing. If you're not giving at least 10% away, don't talk to me. You don't even, you're not even doing like um, the bare minimum of what the Bible talks about generosity. That's yeah, like yeah. a, so even if you're not a Christian, I'd say, are you giving 10%? You know, I'd ask, uh, how much are you giving away? Right, well, right, right. Well, I gave five dollars, you know. Well, don't, don't even talk to me then. You don't know anything about generosity. Yeah. And let me tell you, if you had his money, you'd probably be more greedy than he is. Mm. So don't talk to me. That's, we all need to say, hey, what are we doing with our resources how are we giving away? And right, I, right. I, I used to counsel people. I don't do a lot of premarital counseling now, but I used to. And I said, hey, when I came to the idea of finances, I said, listen, give the first 10% away, save 10%, live off 80%. And just from the first time you get, learn to build a margin that's vertical and horizontal, mm. give, save, and and that's the best financial advice you'll ever get. Mm. I know you'll get all the kinds of stock tips and why, you know, but I, I just gave you the best financial advice you'll ever get. Give, save, and live off. Live with plenty of margin. Yeah. And uh, speaking of financial advice, you can thanks. send the check to Calvary Church, <laughs> X one fifty. All right. <laughs> thanks to you, Crosby and Finn will not be getting billion dollar. Uh, Sorry, Crosby. S- settlements in the will. You, uh, let me tell you this. I, I had a message. You give your kids more if you teach them wisdom than wealth. Mm. Teach them how to make money. Don't give them money. Yeah. Uh, if you're really, if you've made a lot of money. Uh, uh, teach your kids how to do it. Don't mm. give it to them. Now, give them an inheritance. The Bible talks about a wise man gives his yeah, children yeah. an inheritance. So, yes, that's fine to give your kids an inheritance. If you've made a lot of money and you want to pay for your grandkids' oh, education right, right, and right. invest in that's fine. But if you just say, oh, I'm leaving all of it to my kids, I think it's a terrible mistake. Mm. And and let the kids write me a letter. Um, and, 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 you know, it's fine. Give them a little inheritance. That's fine. Yeah. But... If you've been if you've been given a great deal of money, you'd be far better off giving your kids wisdom than wealth. Mm. Teach them how to make it, and then you take what you made and you go give it to somebody. And you go find and again, here's what I'd say: this when you're giving, find a place where the kingdom of God is advancing, and it's a multiplying effect. Mm. That when, because smart people know how to multiply their money, so be smart the way you give. Mm. Don't just give to some charity because it sounds good. Give to where it's having a multiplying impact in the kingdom of God. Now, obviously, I think Calvary is one of those places, but it doesn't have to be Calvary. Right, Find right. a place where it's advancing the kingdom and it's having an exponential impact. Mm. It's good. 
thanks for uh, going in on on that uh, today, Pastor. Appreciate that. Um, like I said, we will put the, uh, the. It's been a really fun series. We're in lots of fun things going on here at Calvary. So we'll put the last sermon in the podcast description. You can check that out if you missed it. Lots of fun things happening here uh, in correspondence with Missions Month. We got a lunch and learn uh, with Brad Briscoe coming up this Friday. We're recording this on a Wednesday. Uh, this coming Friday is that lunch and learn. You can get all that information on Calvary.us. Uh, we also have uh, Calvary Cares is coming up. We have a sending dinner where we're going to be sending out John and Shay Antonucci, Jim and Bernie Hackett, who we just talked about this Sunday. Lots of fun things. All the info, calvary.us. You can check out all the information on that. And uh, those of you that uh, got stopped just this Sunday, Pastor, so many people say, you know, I love the podcast. The podcast is great. Uh, so many of you listen. We are, we're so appreciative of you. Uh, make sure that you uh, review the podcast wherever you're listening. Uh, leave a review, leave a rating. That's the best way that we can kind of get the message out about what we're doing here on the podcast. And uh, we'll be back again with another episode very soon.